I'm going to, to talk mostly about this interface between uh, science, natural sciences and social sciences in the context of, um, of science fiction. Okay, and of course this is, with, with these lights that we need, unfortunately, you can't really tell, but this is, uh, from, this is a character from Game of Thrones and she has a double, double helix here and a single helix there. Now I want to talk a little bit about what we call some of the classic science fiction work and some of the scientific and social themes that were addressed and, and talk a little bit about how well they held up. And the problem is basically can be summarized by this quote from the Blackboard Jungle, that the wind blew, the shit flew, and for weeks the vision was blurred. And we're, we're definitely in that kind of situation right now. And most people will agree that we live in, live in a very complicated world that there are many existential threats uh, facing us, and there seems to be a, a fair amount of, of agreement that natural sciences and social sciences ought to cooperate with each other to try to save humanity in some form or another. And yet, even though everybody agrees we ought to do it, it doesn't happen very much. And I'm gonna talk about why I think that doesn't happen from the standpoint of, of a scientist, and that's because this is sort of what we do. We document a problem, we study the crap out of the problem, we restudy the problem, and then we determine what ought to be done. Then we go to a policy person and we say, make it happen. And we never understand why that doesn't immediately get translated into some sort of program. And the reason for that is because we don't understand and that, that's in fact why there is now this discussion of, of what, what's being called science diplomacy. This is basically a term for teaching scientists how to cope with the rest of the world. That all of this is still true, but before, instead of just saying to a policy person, make it happen, you have to, the scientist needs to convince policy people that there's a problem that only they can solve, and then allow them to determine how to solve it. So the real issue for a scientist who wants to be involved in the future of the world is not to develop policy so much as, as it is to convince policy people that there's a problem that they ought to work with the scientist on and then take over with their, their specializations. And that means overcoming this, this concept called epistemic trespassing. In my day, in, in, in the old days, we used to call that stepping on each other's feet. A really good example of that is that if a, a biologist says anything about physics and there's a physicist in the audience, the physicist will jump up and down on the biologist's face with both feet. If a physicist says anything about biology, a biologist in the audience will do the same thing. If a scientist says something about philosophy, the philosophers will react. All of universities, all academic settings are set up to maintain these kinds of stovepipes, these kinds of specializations, and you're not allowed to talk to each other. You're, you are discouraged from doing it. But the reality is that if we don't cross boundaries at some point, we never learn anything. These stovepipes, these specializations simply become echo chambers. So we can't do this if we actually want to help. We have to figure out how to approach, and in, in, in the article that I sent around about epistemic trespassing, basically the recommendation was have a little humility. Recognize, if you're gonna to talk to somebody from another discipline, recognize that they may actually see something that you don't see because you're so focused in on your ideas that you don't see something. And this is what, what uh, Menachem Fish, a philosopher of science from Tel Aviv, once uh, taught me, is the difference between interfaith dialogue and interfaith learning. He said interfaith dialogue is you have people from two different religions who yell at each other, each one hoping to convert the other one. So interfaith learning is, in his case, Jews understanding how the Vatican sees Judaism and the Vatican trying to understand 
how Judaism sees Catholicism. So that's interfaith learning. Learning about each other, how, learning about ourselves by understanding how other people see us. And I always thought that, was a, that made really good sense. And it's always seemed to me, ever since I began to, to, to think about this issue of how I could cross over or help in a crossover, it's always seemed to me that science fiction was, was exactly a medium where this kind of epistemic trespassing between natural and social sciences is not only allowed, it's encouraged, maybe even demanded. So we actually have a place where this happens and where nobody cares. I mean, nobody, nobody, it's really interesting. It's perfectly acceptable. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple of examples about this. Fear and science. This is what evolutionary biology tells us about, about fear. Animals that are preyed upon have to cope with the stress of possibly being eaten. We call ourselves the man, man the hunter, but evolutionarily, we're descended from prey items. We taught ourselves how to kill, but basically all of our reproductive biology, and this is part of our, our population problem, all of our reproductive biology and our physiology is the physiology of prey items. We reproduce really easily. So that means that we are by nature, by evolutionary nature, fearful. And we cope with our constant fear of reality through this mechanism called psychological denial. That's how we cope with being afraid. Fear in public policy. Here's a classic example of how public policy people have typically dealt with fear. Don't be afraid. How well has that worked? Well, yeah, mixed bag. Sometimes it actually works. It works, in this case, it worked because people wanted to believe that it would work and because it did work in a fairly short period of time. Now, fear in science fiction, we had the Bene Gesserit litany against fear, which, which tells us this statement, this made-up science fiction statement by Frank Herbert tells us that he understands both the biology of fear and the biology of denial. Because this is, this is, this is true, this is bullshit. Okay, so you've, most of you have probably seen this meme. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> okay, and unfortunately, this is just a way for me to get in a shameless plug for our, our new book, which will be out in June. But I'm going to talk about, not surprisingly, climate change and emerging diseases. The science of this is we've got a problem. We've got an enormous problem. We are already spending annually on production costs and costs of treatment, we are spending more on emerging diseases right now than the GDPs of all but 15 countries on this entire planet. And the countries that are affected the most are the ones that can afford it the least. So this is an enormous problem. Policy, what is the arm of, of disease policy? It's the World Health Organization, CDC, things like that. And it's based on a scientific principle called do no harm, which is this incredibly conservative <laughs> element. And in the medical profession, this actually comes from, this do no harm comes from the Hammurabi Code, where if you treated somebody for an infected tooth and he lost the tooth, they took your tooth out. If you treated someone for an infected eye and he lost the eye, they took your eye out. And that's where we get the expression, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And that's why physicians won't do shit until there's a problem where if they treat the best they can, nobody will ever say it's their fault. So this is what happens in terms of emerging diseases. We wait until there's an outbreak. We fly in, we throw technology at it, and we claim we did the best we could and we claimed that we could not have anticipated it, but fortunately, it will never happen again until the next time. What about science fiction and disease? Well, the reality is that many of these, these ideas, many of these things that are happening have already been anticipated. Edgar Allan Poe basically 
said in the Mask of the Red Death, he said, rich people are going to die too. You can't build a wall that will keep the pathogens out, Donald Trump. War of the Worlds was very cool. War of the Worlds was pa pathogens on Earth killing invaders from outer space. That's pretty cool. The Andromeda strain, that was one of the first biotechnology. We're going to create a super bug that will wipe out the bad guys, but then it escapes and it wipes out everybody, so that goes back to the Mask of the Red Death. And then there's my personal favorite, the Screwfy solution, which is a biological control agent story. This is a situation in which is completely imaginary, never could happen here. It's a situation in which suddenly there are reports from all over the world of increased violence against women. And suddenly, human men are killing women all over the world. It turns out that what is happening is that there's an alien race that's decided they want the Earth. And the only impediment to the Earth is human beings, so they want them wiped out. So they've developed a biological control measure in which they have released a substance that makes males attack females. And the males are going to kill the females off, and then, of course, the males will die. And this is it's called the screw fly solution because this is exactly the way agricultural systems try to control pest insects like screw flies. All right, science and civilization. Here's what evolutionary biologist tells us about human civilization, human evolution, because it's the same as every, every species. If the conditions change, run away. If you can't run away, try to cope, and if you can't cope, you go extinct. That's it. So you, some of you have seen this before. At the dawn of the Holocene, human beings developed agriculture and domestication, we became sedentary, we started trading, and the result was we had bigger, healthier women producing bigger, healthier babies. We stopped moving around. We accumulated diseases and we accumulated conflict because our sedentary operations had stuff that non-sedentary people wanted and were happy to come and take. Okay, and seven and a half thousand years ago, the Yamnaya, what's now being called the Yamnaya, civilization came into Europe, Western Europe, and within a very short period of time, almost all of the male genomic signature of Europe that existed before this was gone. They came in, they killed all the men, they impregnated all the women who were remaining, but the native women ultimately won because this hunter-gatherer, cavalry, marauding band of people who came in and killed all the men did not convert Europe 7,500 years ago into a hunter-gatherer society. So these guys came in, wiped out the men, impregnated the women, and the women turned them into farmers. They just changed the male complement, but they didn't change the society, which I think is kind of cool. Modern civilization takes place after that, sedentary living becomes urbanization. We put ourselves more and more in place, in place, in place. We're getting more and more of us. We're becoming more and more dependent on staying in one place. What happens when there's climate change to those civilizations, those cities? Every civilization that has experienced, every urbanized, sedentary civilization that has experienced climate change has been destroyed and never recovered. And that's because cities limit our ability to run away when there's an emergency. In other words, we created a change in our own evolutionary trajectory. We took away our escape route. And so this is what we have today. These are just a few of the ways in which major urban settings are susceptible to climate change related disasters. Here's the issue for policy. We've transcended our evolutionary legacy by constructing a technological niche for ourselves. 
within which we've been living beyond our means because we didn't recognize it, because a bunch of scientists said, no problems, we'll just create technology and we'll always stay ahead of the curve, and the bill is now due. And we have no idea how to, how to cope with that. This is not particularly new. Okay? This is actually from a 1950s mystery novel. This is a statement by, the, the, the novel's by Raymond Chandler, but this is the detective Philip Marlowe, think Humphrey Bogart, talking about Los Angeles. He said, a city no worse than others, a city rich and vigorous and full of pride, a city lost and beaten and full of emptiness. We've known this. This is, this is exactly the stuff that Peter was talking about. We have known this and we've done nothing about it. We are a mess. Okay? Think about the two versions of the day the Earth stood still. One was about nuclear de uh, holocaust, and the, the most recent one is, is about climate change and destroying the, the biosphere. And this is one of my favorite memes, that <laughs> aliens that drive past Earth lock the doors so that their kids aren't possibly going to be exposed to Earthlings. So here's one future from science fiction, one future for humanity. This is... H.G. Wells' time machine, in the far future, humanity has blown up civilization, technological civilization, and all that's left are a bunch of beautiful, stupid, useless people living above ground, called the Eloi, and a bunch of ugly, mutated technocrats living underground, called the Mulak, who are actually keeping the above ground existence going. Or, Another version of this, the corn booth in the 1950s, the little black bag and the, the book called The Marching Morons, in which he envisioned a world in which uh, is basically what, what Francis Galton and some of the British eugenicists believed. The stupid people are going to spend all their time reproducing and the smart people won't reproduce and pretty soon we're going to have a world in which there are a whole bunch of dumb people and just a few smart people and those smart people are going to have to take care of the dumb people. Okay, another future. Okay, this is the, the foundation future. This is how Raven Selden came into existence. Basically, Harry Selden was a character in the foundation who saw that the Galactic Empire, despite the fact that it seemed that they were at the height of their, their internet prowess, the Galactic Empire was about to collapse. And nobody wanted to believe him. Nobody would believe him, no one would believe him. And it's a, and a typical example of this. At the start of every disaster movie, there's a scientist being ignored. The capital city was called Trantor, and this is, is a, a cartoon from, from that, because Trantor was a city, a whole planet that was one city. There were basically no green spaces left on it at all. But this was basically an optimistic story because it was not just a story of the collapse of the Galactic Empire, it was a story of the collapse and rebuilding of the Galactic Empire, and using scientific principles to shorten the period of time it would take to rebuild. So that's pretty good. There's another possible future for us, which Asimov also had a hand in. This is the future robots. Now it looks like, this looks like a perfect place where science and policy get together, because look, the scientists say robotization could reduce the human population and still maintain our technology. The policy people say the same thing. This is great, this is really great, right? Asimov comes along and says, well, we need some safeguards, of course, so we'll invent the laws of robotics. So here are the four laws of robotics. Blah, 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 okay? Robots get to do a lot of things as long as they don't kill people. And the important thing is the zeroth law that Asimov recognized in the 1980s, and that was robots can't do anything that will put humanity as a collective at risk, as opposed to just individual humans. And some of you have seen my, my talk about this. The four laws of robotics can be mutated into the four laws of biotics, where robots are replaced with humanity, and human beings are replaced with the biosphere, and it works exactly the same way. So this is pretty cool. This is pretty interesting, except for one problem. 
Asimov didn't have any robots in the Galactic Empire. They'd all been outlawed, they'd all gone extinct, they'd all died out. Turns out later on there was one, and, but that, was a, that turned out to be a plot device because Asimov had gotten himself in a corner and couldn't figure it out. But basically, there are no robots in the world created by the guy who created the Four Laws of Robotics. Why is that? Well, it turns out that there's a critical flaw in the laws of robotics and laws of biotics, and that is basically, what if the robots determine that humanity is the greatest threat to humanity? And they have a mandate to protect humanity. Okay, one possibility is that they just explode at that point. They get into a do loop and they all shut down. The other possibility is that they will very rationally decide to reduce the human population. In which case, we're not going to need terminators. Our vacuum cleaners will kill us. Everything will follow the four laws of robotics, but it'll take us out anyway. So the reality is, at the end of the day, the reality is that it's about fear and denial. It's just exactly what Peter was talking about. It's personal responsibility. It's overcoming fear and denial. And one of the ways to do that, I mean, Peter's pointed out quite rightly that scientists cope with fear and denial by being so conservative that even when they see something bad happening, they won't say it out loud. Okay? But the reality is, there's another way to cope with this, and that is to join forces with people who are not in the echo chamber. I mean, maybe you end up making a bigger echo chamber. We don't know, but we've, always, we've got to try something. And the bottom line is that there is no option except taking personal responsibility for saving ourselves. Technology is not going to save us. The robots, think of the, this whole robot thing that I gave you as technology in general, just as a token for technology is going to save us. Technology is not going to save us. We're going to save us or not. And we don't know the answer to that, but part of my particular lesion or <laughs> chronic depression is that I recognize the existential threat. I'm scared to death of it, but I'm not going to stop trying to do something about it. So thank you very much.